Okay, we are continuing the book of Luke. And I believe we were right before the triumphal entry. So why don't we start? I know that's technically 19, which was last week, but I think having the triumphal entry is important. Um, I think it'd be good for us to take a look there. So Luke 19, starting at 28. So let's look at uh, Jesus here in, uh, so 28, uh, or sorry, 19 verse 28, and we'll just do Palm Sunday here, basically. And here's the thing. Jerusalem and Luke here is kind of the goal. And we'll talk about him setting his face that direction. Jerusalem is the ultimate goal of this book, uh, that Jesus gets there. Uh, and that what Jesus is going to do there is kind of that ultimate, you know, goal of, and ultimate thing of what we're looking for. So, uh, so after Jesus had said this, you know, talked about uh, the kingdom of God and that it was coming and so, and the, and so on. Um, after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem as he ap approached Bethage and Pet Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives. And so what you have is, if you come in, when you've seen the pictures of Jerusalem, most of that time, that's actually being taken from the Mount of Olives. That's being taken from what used to be Bethany uh, and Bethage, the, that, that kind of area, because you're looking down on the Temple Mound and you see that area there. That's the direction that Jesus would be coming, because the bottom of that hill is the uh, Garden of uh, Gethsemane down there, um, down in that area. So Jesus is kept coming up and over, and he's now looking down over at Jerusalem. And he says, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell them the Lord needs it. Because that works. <laughs> you know, and I think, I don't think the disciples are given enough credit here, by the way, because the disciples don't go, uh, Jesus, come on, you know, if we go and just untie a coat and start walking away with it, and somebody says, what are you doing? And I go, well, the Lord has need of it. You know, I could go out and take one of your guys' cars and just like, you know, so why are you taking my car? The Lord needs it. Yeah, how, how are you going to react to that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's probably not gonna be a good reaction. It's, you're not gonna be like, oh, the Lord has need it. Oh, here, take it. And my wallet too. Um, and so, to the disciples' credit, when they often get ripped on for not having enough faith, here, for a change, they do it right. So, um, let me just put that one. There we go. Um, and so he just says, tell them that the Lord has need of it. Verse 35, they brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As they went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the, the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And we'll come back to that there in a second, but let's read through the rest of this. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, if you, even you, had known on this day what would bring, what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when the enemies will build their embankments against you and encircle you and hem you in on all sides. They will dash you to the ground, and you, you and your children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of, the, of God's coming to you. So Jesus comes in, uh, gets the donkey. Um, I've always loved the fact that I think it's Mark gives us a little bit more. Uh, maybe it's Matthew. 
Actually, I think it's Matthew. Gives us a little bit more of the guy, you know, they come out and they go, why are you taking our colt? He says, the Lord has need of it. And they're like, okay. Um, so I've always considered this one of Jesus' miracles. It's oddly not listed as one most of the time, but I think it is. I mean, to have that happen. Um, so the, the verse 38, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So what is it, why is it important that they are saying this? Why, why is it important that they're saying this? Because let's, let's jump ahead to the next one. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. So what they're saying has to be pretty, it's got to be bad. Because they're not angry that the disciples are breaking a noise ordinance. They're not saying, well, your disciples are being too loud. Could you ask them to turn it down a bit? Why are they upset? Give me a guess. Yeah. Okay, they're thinking that he's the Messiah. Well, Yes, in, in Messiah, and in, in, not in the, the terms that, you know, we think of Messiah, but terms of this is the new king that's coming. Because this psalm was often used for uh, re-entry of the king into Jerusalem. It's also used at coronations and, and those kind of things. And so they're saying, guess what? The new king is here. And the Pharisees are going, shut up. The Romans are going to be so ticked. Don't get us all killed. And he says, rebuke your disciples. Now, do they also probably not like the fact that he's got so many disciples and they're like running around and they're like screaming about him and all this good stuff? Absolutely. Um, but this is one of those areas where Jesus' crucifixion starts to make a little bit more sense in that this is why they frame him for trying to be a king. When, when, they, when, Pilate, when they bring him before Pilate and the accusation is, well, he's trying to usurp you know, Caesar, this is one of the reasons why. Because the people are thinking, they're not thinking, great, this guy's coming to die for our sins. He's come to save us from hell. No, they're thinking he's come to save us from the hell of the Romans. By the way, as much as I hate the movie, um, there's a movie called Life of Brian, which I cannot stand. Uh, however, there is a clip in it that is really darn funny. Um, the Jews, the, the, the insurrection Jews, the Jews that are uh, uh, trying to, uh, you know, they hate the Romans. They're, they're trying to cause a revolt against the Romans. They're having a discussion and they're like, what have the Romans ever done for us? And they're like, well, they did build lots of roads. Yes, yes, yes. But what have they ever done for us? Well, they did give us sanitation and, you know, clean drinking water and so on. Yes, yes, yes. But what else have they ever done for us? Well, they did give us a really good legal system. And, you know, and so, yes, yes, yes. But whatever they ever done for us, and they just keep on going on about all the things that the Romans did for them. Um, but yeah, but other than that, like after about eight, nine, 10 things, they're like, well, what have they done for us? Other than that, and they're like, well, other than those things, nothing. And <laughs> so it's kind of, you know, it is the Romans that they're worried about here, probably more than anything. But at the same token, there's also the fact that this Jesus coming in and being loved by the people this much threatens their authority too. So it's not just the Romans that they're worried about. So basically Jesus in doing this is ticking off everybody. So in, in, in the end it says, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. It's peace is what Jesus brings. But what's interesting is it's fought against. Now, why do you think they're fighting against it? Not the people standing there, but the Pharisees and the teachers and so on. You guys are such a talkative bunch today. Is it the weather? Just so dreary out there, everybody's just like, ugh. I get it. Well, Let's put, it, let's put ourselves in this position. How do we do a change? 
How do we deal when our authority or something that we have control over is threatened? We don't do so well. <laughs> um, and so, you know, the, they, they are fighting it. Yes, Jesus is bringing peace and willing to bring peace, but they're going to fight against the tooth and nail because it threatens their authority. It threatens their, you know, uh, their power. And they're going to fight against it tooth and nail. Um, I've actually seen this a decent amount recently, and I, I find it odd that I've never experienced it in my life until the last couple of years, and I've experienced it multiple times where people are willing to destroy what they built and what they have instead of it being able to succeed without them. They would actually prefer it to burn to the ground, to get shut down, to go out of business, all these different things, than to have it succeed without them. Um, I have a, a, a relative that, that, that's dealing with that right now. Um, there's an older uh, parent and um, that would prefer to see the whole thing go tumbling down to the ground than to have it succeed without them, even if it means screwing over other family members. We have this thing where if it's, if we lose our power, our control, all of this, we'll fight against it, even if it's for something even better. Because, you know, and I've seen this, in, and it's not just in businesses, I've seen this in ministry, I've seen this in a lot of different things over the last couple of years, where people would prefer to see it scorched to the ground than to succeed without them. Well, that's where the Pharisees are right now. They're seeing Jesus having all this, uh, everybody's adoring him, they're raising him up, but they're like, no, this is bad. And so he's, they, they attack him. Now, as Jesus gets up to Jerusalem, what does he get upset about? At verse 41 and on. He knows in 70 AD, which wouldn't have been AD at the time. But, you know. <laughs> no, you're exactly right. I'm just giving you grief. Uh, in 70 AD, the Romans are going to come through and flatten the whole thing. To the point that we do not know today where the temple used to stand. We know it used to stand on top of the temple mound. That's it. That's the only thing we know. Um, there's a good guess that it's probably where the Church of the Rock or the Mosque of the Rock now stands, the Dome of the Rock, uh, because there is a rock there that is thought to have been the rock on which Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac. But nobody knows for sure, because when they when they says there was no stone standing on top of one another, that's exactly what happened. Um, because the Romans basically pulled the stones apart so that uh, they could get at the gold that might be in between the, you know, like when they were putting the gold leaf on the walls, they wanted to make sure they got it all. So they literally ripped every stone apart so they could make sure they got everything even in between. Um, really kind of messed up, you know, how bad it was. But Jesus warns them. He says, don't, you know, and he tells the disciples, when you see this coming, run. Don't hang out. Run. So, so Jesus comes into Jerusalem as a king. Uh, and they're proclaiming him almost as such because of the psalm that they're using. And that's why the Pharisees tell them to, to shut their yaps. But Jesus says, you know what? If they don't cry out, somebody else will. So Jesus goes straight into the temple area. Then he entered the temple area and began driving out those who were selling. As it is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of robbers. Now, here's a thought. I'm just going to throw this out there. If they had been using it for a house of prayer, do you think they might have actually seen Jesus coming? Like in a good way? If they had been focused on what God wanted them to be focused on, they might have actually seen the Messiah versus seen him as a threat. Um, and to be honest, I think we have to be careful of this one in our own churches. Um, there's a lot of churches that it's why I struggle with coffee. Not the coffee like, like, hey, we have coffee here for you, but we're going to have a gigantic bookstore and we're going to have all this, you know, um, Joyce Myers. If you ever go to Joyce Myers Church, uh, when I lived in St. Louis, the, she, her church was down there. Um, if you go in, as soon as you walk in, every single screen has got advertisements for her books and the next uh, um, 
um, and the next seminar and all this different stuff. And there's book tables everywhere and there's CD tables everywhere. And, and so I've always been really just kind of, because of this, um, really cautious about selling stuff in church. Um, donation, if you want to pay, give like a buck for the coffee, great, whatever, you know, helps pay for it. But when you start turning the church into like, okay, we've got our, you know, high-end coffee shop and our bookstore and this and this and this, it, it starts to make me feel uneasy. I don't know about you guys. And maybe you don't. Maybe you look at it, you're like, I don't know, as long as they're selling biblical books. Well, the only problem is they weren't selling Ikea furniture in the temple. They were selling sacrifices, you know, to be used in the... Now, part of the problem is they were ripping them off. Now, this is where the two sides come into this story. Some would say, well, it wasn't that they were selling stuff in the temple. It was that they were ripping people off because they knew they had kind of a monopoly. And so that, that's where some would say is the problem, which, to be honest, ripping people off in the temple, is that a problem? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, so is it that they're selling stuff or is it that they're ripping them off? And that's where the argument starts to come in. And since I'm going to throw this grenade in the middle of you, what do you think? The, the twins selling $10 for a pop. Yeah, I mean, well, it's very good pop, though. It's very, it's much better than the pop outside the stadium. <laughs> yeah, because they know you, they have a captive audience. And so, you know, uh, in the temple, you had to give your uh, offering with, a, with the, 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 the specific type of coin. And if your realm didn't have that, you had to get an exchange there. And, you know, the exchange rates were terrible. And so they were making money hands over fist with the exchange rates. So that's one area. What do you think? Was it? They're both wrong? Okay. Yeah. But you, you, can't, you could make the, 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 the case, like, okay, let's say, let's say we have a, a, a high-end coffee shop here at Messiah suddenly, which, to be honest, I'm, do you people like the coffee here? So, could, uh, and, the, and I'm going to actually ask this. Wait, here I'm going to I'm going to make a quick survey because, and the reason I'm going to ask this. Whoop. Sorry, I forgot. You guys can't see me. I need to stand. Sorry. Um, and the reason I ask this, and for those of you online that go to Bible study regularly, let me know if you like the coffee here. Because and the reason I'm asking this is, we specifically get a blend that they don't sell anymore. And it was a blend specifically designed for churches that's weaker. So we're paying the same, maybe a little bit cheaper, but the, the blend is actually weaker. So if you guys are like, you know, I'm sorry, that stuff tastes terrible, uh, or it's really weak or whatever it is, let me know. And we can get a better, you know, blend of coffee. But this is the blend that we've always had, and they just keep selling it to us and we keep buying it. But apparently, like, it's got, like, a quarter less grounds in it than most of the other stuff. Lighter or less? Like, le lighter. It's like, like a lighter flavor. It gets waterier. So, do you guys like the coffee, or would you like something a little bit stronger? Yeah. And who knows? Maybe we get, you know, somebody wants to go buy us, like, you know, 30 cases of Starbucks. We'll use that. So, you know. Ooh, somebody put something in the chat. Let's see if they, they got something. <laughs> Not, nope. For the urbans, nope is in you like, you don't like it? Because we still have a decaf, don't get me wrong. It's just the main one, so. All right. Looks like everybody else here on the chat is saying that they, they're not a big fan either. It's not good. All right. I'll, I'll talk to Don about it this week, and we'll see if we can... Uh, we, unfortunately, you'll probably have to drink up what we have because I'm not going to waste the coffee that we have. Uh, at the same token, uh, the next stuff we get, we can just try to say, let's get something better. You know what we could do? We could have taste test day. When? When do we have coffee? Well, right at the moment, we don't have any. But eventually, we're going to have coffee again, Lord willing. Yeah, no, no, sorry. Everybody's like, where's that coffee? It's not here. Yeah, normally we'd have it now, but with the COVID, we can't, and so on and so on. So, yeah. 
Well, and most people are willing to drink whatever, but you know, and who knows, maybe we get some other stuff and then we'll have like one pot of, if you like the week old stuff, here it is, you know, kind of thing. But I was raised on, you know, Lutheran coffee is supposed to be something that you can put a spoon in and it'll still stand up, you know? So when I got here, I'm like, and I walk, look at how watery it is, I'm going, this doesn't seem right. So, all right, sorry, that was completely off topic. Yes, Don. afraid of them. And he's okay with them yelling that he's the Messiah. The problem is, I don't think, I, I, this is one area where I will disagree with you. I, now, I agree, many of them didn't have a, even the disciples, they didn't have a full one. Correct. And they believe he's the Messiah, but. And, but this is where I'm going to disagree with you. Just for, I'm, I'm going to, re, I'm going to re, recap for the people online, just in case they didn't hear you. First off, uh, Don's just disagreeing with me that, well, not disagreeing with me, thinking that there's more to it. And, I, and here's the thing, any mob, any large group, you're going to have differing opinions in that group. You know, if you go downtown at a riot, you're going to find some people that are there because I'm here for social justice. And then you're going to find somebody that's like, I'm here for a free TV. You know, you're going to have differing of opinion even in any group that you have. Um, where, but what he, uh, Don's saying is that one of the things that he's like, Jesus has been preaching for three years now. I'm not that kind of Messiah. I'm not what you think. Where I would disagree is that, yes, he's been preaching that for three years. How well have they gotten that message? Terribly. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and even when the disciples, even when Jesus ascends into heaven, it's like, are you going to restore, are you going to basically kick out the Romans now? It's like, yeah, you guys still don't get it. And, and I, I think Jesus, when, once they ask that, Jesus is like, I can't get up to heaven fast enough, people. <laughs> Um, and so there will be those that probably do understand exactly who he really truly is. But I think the majority don't get it yet. Not until Pentecost, as you said, not till after the resurrection, not till, you know, all, after all of that, and they finally see. Um, they certainly claim that the Messiah. Correct. But I'm thinking that, and, and to be honest, one of the reasons I kind of go with, or I, I, I like this understanding best is it helps understand why, you know, when, when the disciple, when the, the, the uh, Jews bring Jesus forward, well, where are they getting this stuff from? It's that good old, the best lies have 90% truth and 10% lie kind of idea. 
if the people have said this, you know, they said these things, it's easier for them to go, well, he thinks he's a king. Whether you're just making it out of sheer error, you know, there's nothing there at all. Now, granted, Pilate sees through it and says, this is a bunch of hooey. Um, Yes. But not Correct. And and this is where, to be honest, I'm not going to argue with you too much on it because it's like you could be right because I don't know what was in the heart of all those people in that crowd. Maybe they really did understand, who, you know, that Jesus was coming as a Messiah, like the the heavenly Messiah, the the Messiah of our hearts and our souls. But at the same token. I would tend to the idea that there was a lot of them that were really thinking, here comes a king to get rid of the Romans, because I think it makes more, it makes a lot of sense as to what happens and how they act moving forward. The one thing I do want to reiterate, though, and Don said this too at the beginning, was one of the reasons Jesus is ticked is the, the spot where they're selling. Now, I'm not sure if you guys have ever seen a, a picture of the temple. It's got these different... Um, it's got the temple of the court of the women, the court of the Gentiles, and then you know the the, the Jewish court, and then the whole the actual temple, the Holy of Holies area, inside of that. You couldn't go beyond each one. Like ladies couldn't go beyond this part. Jews or Gentiles could not go beyond this part. If you, you know the Gentiles went beyond this part, they were killed. And so it's in the the court of the Gentiles that they're selling all this stuff. So the one place that the Gentiles could go to worship has been turned into a marketplace. And so as, and I liked how you put it, um, their, their mission program <laughs> has been turned into their money-making machine. And so, you know, Jesus is going, I've come to seek and save the lost and you've turned the mission program that's supposed to reach out to the, you know, those that don't know, you know, the, 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 the word, those that don't know God into a, you know, money-making machine so however one of the things i will say at this is that's one of the reasons i am cautious so if we ever get to the point that we're like hey let's open up this store inside the church during sunday morning i may buck it a wee bit just because i really don't feel like getting hit by a whip by god so yeah um one of my favorite uh memes uh, these little pictures, for those of you who don't know what a meme is, a little picture with a little caption that's usually pretty funny, is uh, when you ask yourself the question, what would Jesus do? Just remember that picking up a whip is within the realm of reason. <laughs> so, all right, let's continue on. Uh, Jesus' authority question, verse 20, or chapter 20. No, oh, we got time. Okay. One day as he was teaching the people in the temple courts and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, together with the elders, came up to him. Tell us by what authority you're going to doing or you're doing these things, they said. Who gave you this authority? He replied, I will ask you a question. Tell me, John's baptism, was it from heaven or from men? Watcha! They discussed it amongst themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he'll ask, then why didn't you believe him? However, if we say from men, all the people will stone us because they persuaded they were persuaded that John was a prophet. So they answered, we don't know where he was from. Jesus answered, neither then will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. Now, as soon as they get done asking that, and as soon as uh, Jesus answers them, he went on to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard rented it to some farmers, and went away for a long time. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. They sent another servant, but that one they also beat and treated shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. They still sent a third, and they wounded him and threw him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, what should I do? I will send my son, whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him and take his inheritance, and his inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When the people heard this, they said, may this never be. 
Jesus looked directly at them and asked, then what is the meaning of which is, what is, which is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the capstone. Everyone who falls on that, that, that stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked at, for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew that he had spoken this parable against them, but they were afraid of the people. So Jesus is, he, he talks about uh, John the Baptist and he says, where did John the Baptist come from? God or man? Was it his own stuff he was doing or was it God? And they refuse to acknowledge because they don't believe John the Baptist was from God. However, they also know that if they say that, the people are going to rise up and just destroy him. So Jesus tells this parable, and he talks about the, the vineyard and the people that are sent. Who are the people that are sent? The prophets. How many of the prophets ended their lives well? <laughs> Not many of them. It, tradition says that Isaiah was put in a log and sawed in half. I mean... You get Elijah who says, Lord, kill me now because I'm the last one left. Now, was he the last one left? No, but did really many people listen to him? No, he had a hard life. Uh, all the prophets can be pretty much shown. Jeremiah, did the people listen to Jeremiah? And, and you know, when, when he's talking about the, the, the repent or, you know, this, that we're going to be destroyed. Nope. Jeremiah goes off to exile with the rest of them. So Jesus is talking about, I said, God's, the, we've sent people to you, but you keep bumping them off or mistreating them. He says, well, the son finally comes, who is, well, surprise, him. And he says, they kill him thinking that they're going to take the inheritance. Now, does this make any sense whatsoever? No. No. They're, they're delusional. They're thinking, oh, we kill him. We get this vineyard. It's ours. We get to say how this vineyard is run. We get to keep all of this for ourselves. That's the idea. As long as we bump off the, the, the air, we get it all. Well, no. And what Jesus says, it's going to be taken away from you and given to others who will listen. Now, does this go over well? <laughs> no. So this is one of those other reasons why Jesus is like, oh, I, I, I'm done with you people. All right. Um, whoop, I went back too far. One second here. Um, since we don't have a ton of time, do you want to do paying taxes to Caesar? Widow's offering we're talking about in church today. What would you like to hit before we have to call it a day? How about paying taxes to Caesar? That's a good one, especially in our modern day and age right now. <laughs> Let's end it on one that uh, we can definitely apply to our lives. Keeping a close, close watch on him, they sent spies who pretended to be honest. They, they hoped to catch Jesus in something he said so that they might hand him over to the power and authority of the governor. So the spies questioned him. By the way, uh, does this happen in the church nowadays? Yeah. Uh, I had a professor that he had a, a member of his who hated his gut. So every church service or every, time, every Sunday, he would show up. Uh, he knew when the sermon would start. He planned it. So he'd come in right as the sermon was supposed to start. He'd go to the very front. He would sit down and in the front pew, put a tape recorder on the front of the pew and hit record. And as soon as the sermon was done, he would hit stop and leave. And then he would send the, um, the tape into his district president and said, this guy is a terrible preacher, blah, 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 blah. He's evil. We need to get rid of him. And here's the evidence. <laughs> so it happens, you know, the, um, in uh, Bonhoeffer's day, the, the Nazis sent uh, people to sit in his pew and listen to him to try to see if there was anything. By the way, did they know who it was? Absolutely. <laughs> and so they'd even talk to the guy. They even talk about him in the sermon. It's like, by the way, Bob, here's a part you're not going to like, you know, kind of thing. So let's keep going. So this, the spies questioned him. Teacher, 
We know that you speak and teach what is right and what you do not, that you do not show partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? He saw through their duplicity and said to them, show me a denarius whose portrait and inscription on it. Caesar, Caesar's, they replied. He said to them, then give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. They were unable to trap him what he said in what he said there in public and astonished by his answer, they became silent. So what does Jesus mean by give to Caesar what is Caesar and to God what is God's? Okay. Yeah, pay taxes, and it's not an either or. So he's saying, you know, in the prayer today, and we said it last week too, government is given to us as a blessing. It's there to, re it's there to maintain order. It's there to be able to provide uh, services. It is there to be able to help those in need. Government is a blessing from God. Now, is a specific government a blessing from God? Like socialism is the blessing from God or capitalism is the blessing from God or monarchy is the blessing from God? No, it's government, that God would use government to bless us. Um, so when you hear somebody say capitalism is the most go is the godly way and everything else is evil, well, not necessarily. I mean, you could have a blend, you could have this, you could have that, you know. Now, I'm also going to sit there and say I wouldn't be a big fan of communism since God communism in general by its basis is godless. You know, an atheist and, you know, in hates religion in pretty much all its forms. And you can make some of that case for socialism in, in different forms as well. Um, so you got to be careful when you say that. But just to say this is the official form of government that God loves. Well, for most of the Old Testament, what was the form of government? Monarchy, you know. And most of us would not agree that we think monarchy is, a, you know, the way we want to go to right now. Anybody want to be, you know, want to bring monarchy back? Yeah, I didn't think so. So, you know, the key here is that government is God's way of blessing us. And so what we owe to the government, we should give. So if you owe taxes, pay your stinking taxes, um, you know, to the government. Now, why would the, the Jews not have liked that answer? Did they like their government? No, it was it was it was a uh, it was a uh, an occupying government. By the way, it was a pagan government, you know, and so it was not a government they were especially fond of, but it did bring order uh, to a chaotic time. So. Um, Jesus is saying, pay taxes to the taxes you owe, even if it's to somebody you don't especially like. At the same token, what do you owe God? I owe myself to God. And I'm going to bring this up now because this is a really important one, I think, for us right now. Bless you. It's the COVID. It's funny because Don uh, had COVID this last or for a little while there, and uh, apparently his doctor said he was completely free of COVID, but then he got a sinus infection, which made him cough like crazy. And I was like, "You're not coming back in the office." <laughs> He's like, "But I'm free of COVID." I'm like, "I don't care because anybody coming in the office is just going to hear you sneeze and cough, and they're going to be like, oh, we're all going to die." So, so, but what Jesus is getting at here is. We are loyal to our government in what we can be loyal to. And if you owe taxes, you pay taxes. At the same token, where does your heart belong? Where, to God. Where do you belong? To God. And that's where things get messed up. Is where we start to give our hearts to our government. And as... Because Luther, what was Luther's thing about uh, um, the um, what is your God in the small catechism? Does anybody remember? That to which you 
look to your greatest good and that to which you look in your time of need. And so if we see our greatest good coming from government, we've got messed up priorities. So we respect the government, we pray for the government, we pay our taxes like good people should, and we obey the laws to which we can. So if the, go the government says, you Christians can no longer uh, talk about Jesus, do we obey that law? No. It is our Christian duty to disobey that law. But what's interesting, how do we do it? In the most loving, kind, and generous way we possibly can. It's one of the reasons I, I really respect the heck out of Martin Luther King Jr. He, he went, this isn't right. Could he have said, we're going to riot and destroy everything? Absolutely. And there were people that did that at that time. Um, however, he said, we're Christians. How do we as Christians protest? How do we as Christians fight against this? And through that, what's great about what he did, and this is where I like what he did versus what's kind of happened in our society right now. When people saw the Christians and the other people that were marching for civil rights getting beaten and gassed and shot with, you know, water cannons, what was the general opinion of how did the public opinion start to change? Yeah, this is wrong. We need to fix this. And, and so change was brought about by that Christian way of thinking and acting and, and protesting. When we see on the news, the news going, this is a peaceful, peaceful protest and there's literally a car burning behind them. <laughs> And, you know, people are looting and destroying other people's businesses and houses and stuff like that. People see that and they go, this is not helpful. This is not a good thing. And it actually turns a lot of people against it. And so we as Christians need to fight for what is right. So in the instance, like we've been talking about with the civil rights thing and stuff like that, we as Christians need to speak up. If there's pre police brutality, we need to speak up. And we need to act and we need to vote and we need to say what is right and wrong. We need to teach our kids what is right and wrong and all these different things. We need to stand up, but how we do it can, you know, be very important for us. And I'm getting off topic. So I apologize. We're going to slide back. Um, but the key here is in what Jesus is saying, what do we do? Well, when it comes to the government, we pay our taxes and we, we act as a, as Christians. On the other side, what do we owe God? Our hearts. And it's when those two get flipped or both of them go on one, uh, on one side that we end up with having problems. Make sense? Questions, because it's time. Because that's a controversial one, I know. And by the way, when I say all government is, you know, God can use any government, can he? Yeah. But there's a lot of them out there that are based on being, getting rid of God. Because that's the problem with communism is communism is based on the idea that you owe everything to the government. You owe bo uh, both sides of this, your heart and your money, to the government. And that's why the, when you know communism and a lot of these other governments, one of the first things they get rid of are the pastors and Christians. You know, so that they can, you know, you don't owe everything. You know, that was why Marx, hates the, Marx hated the church because it made people content where they were. If you believe that your better life is later, are you gonna be okay being a serf? I'm not saying, are you gonna like it? Are you gonna be able to get through? Yeah, because you're constantly looking forward to, this stinks, but I have glory in heaven to look forward to. I have a mansion in heaven. That's bigger than the, the, the king of my, you know, or the, the, the baron of my area. So you have to get rid of that idea of glory in heaven before people go, this stinks, I need to kill that guy and take his stuff because here and now is the best I can ever have. And so if here and now is all there is, I need to take whatever I can in the here and now. So that's why they do that. But, huh. Awesome. Any questions though? I can't see, I didn't see if any 
No, no questions down there. You guys are so talkative today. Look, it's even getting brighter outside. It should have helped. All right, next week we are going to be talking crucifixion. And I am super pumped because Pastor Bob is going to be preaching on that one. And I'm excited to hear what he has to say. So the, uh, um, the other thing I wanted to say, for those of you that were in early church, I messed up. Uh, I forgot a prayer. Um, I had it written on my sheet of paper and I got distracted because I don't know how I got distracted, but I did. Um, Sauna Het, we're going to be, we've been praying for um, as a staff. It got sent out on the prayer chain, uh, but we're also praying for our own worship. Uh, Sauna was supposed to be playing this weekend. That's why Jody's playing. Um, she lost her father this week. And so please make sure you keep her in your prayers, her and Steve and the whole Het family. Uh, as they mourn and uh, that you would be with them and uh, that we just lift them up. So, all right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, this week we get a lot of stuff where we're seeing it's all about our hearts. Uh, today in the sermon, we're going to be talking about generosity and kindness and giving what uh, of the things we have and the widow's might. Uh, and it's all about the heart. It's not how much we give, it's how we give it and the heart that is behind it. And Lord, when uh, Jesus is talking about the, uh, the, the coin, it's the same thing. Where is our heart? So Lord, we ask that you would help us as we leave this place to look to where our heart is. And if our heart is in the wrong place, Lord, we ask one, that you would forgive us, but two, that through your Holy Spirit, you would help guide us so that our hearts mark, might be more and more directed to you. And so Lord, we ask as we leave this place that you would bless us, and that you would make us a blessing to all those around us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.